hub, and spoke. Audio Collective. Hey there, Print is Dead podcast. My name is Mike Rogie, and I am the editor and owner of Mountain Gazette. If you can believe it, print ain't dead. Despite the name of this podcast, Mountain Gazette is a biannual outdoor culture magazine. And if you're wondering, Mike, why does this sound so weird? It's because I just got off a chairlift and forgot to record this podcast ad. I promise we're much better at making magazines than we are making podcast ads. So I'll keep it short, enjoy the issue, and learn more about us at mountaingazette.com. The new releases keep coming from Commercial Type with Review Wide, Nicola, and the elegant Mulan in their main library, and Feature Flat, New Weights of Royal Gothic, and Punch now in the vault. Visit commercialtype.com to see and test these and the rest of our ever-growing library. I gradually came to see that actually I did understand exactly what the New Yorker needed. And it was a great and wonderful literary challenge, as well as being just an editing challenge to think that I could save this crown jewel of the empire, as it were. The New Yorker was dying when I took it over and it was gradually losing all of its advertisers. And it was a very aging demographic. It was a dying brand. And if I hadn't come in then at that moment, it really was on its last legs. It was quite close to folding. It was a very exciting moment to be able to come in and, and save it. This is Print is Dead, Long Live Print, a podcast about magazines and the people who made and make them. I'm Deborah Bishop. I'm Patrick Mitchell. I'm George Jandron. As George Bernard Shaw once said, England and America are two countries separated by the same language. Turns out, it may be more than just the language. Early in my career, it became clear the British were coming. The first wave arrived when I was an editor at New York Magazine. John Bradshaw, Anthony Hayden Guest, Julian Allen, Nick Cohn, all colorful characters who brought with them, as author Kurt Anderson said in episode two, an ability to kick people in the shins that was lacking in the United States, and kick they did. A decade later, the British trickle became a surge that appeared everywhere on the mastheads of premier American magazines. There was Anna Wintour, and Liz Tilbaris, and Harry Evans, Joanna Coles, Glenda Bailey, Andrew Sullivan, Anthea Disney, James Truman, and of course, today's guest, Tina Brown. And the invasion continues today, with the British taking over our newsrooms and boardrooms. Emma Tucker at the Wall Street Journal, Will Lewis at the Washington Post, Mark Thompson at CNN, Colin Myler at the New York Daily News. But none of them made it bigger, faster than Tina Brown. Cy Newhouse never knew what hit him, Brown, having just turned 30, grabbed the wheel of Condé Nast's flailing 1983 relaunch of Vanity Fair and proceeded to dominate the cultural conversation for the next decade. And then, another massive turnaround at The New Yorker, the first multimedia partnership at Talk, nailing digital early with The Daily Beast, then Newsweek, and more recently, the books, the events, the podcast. So Tina, what exactly is it with you Brits that makes your work so extraordinary? Well, I think that the plurality of the British press means that there's a lot more experimentation and less sort of stuffed shirtery going on. The English press is far more eclectic in its attitude and in its high-low aesthetic, essentially. And there's much less of a pompous attitude to journalism. They see it as a job. They don't see it as a sacred calling. And I think there's something to be said for that, you know, because it's a little bit more scrappy, I think, than it is here. And I think that's served us well, actually. So it's no surprise and to learn that there were early signs of future Tina. Here, we call it good trouble. Tina's got another name for it. As the story goes, teenage Tina, blessed with tremendous skepticism of authority, somehow managed to get herself kicked out of not one, not two, but three, three boarding schools. Her offenses, nothing serious, just what the ASME Hall of Famer refers to as her crimes of attitude. And when you think about it, what is any great magazine but a crime of attitude? Now, let's meet Tina. I want to start in what might seem like an improbable place, which is January 22nd, 1989, and the meeting you had with Frank Benick. And if I was writing a post about that meeting 
today. I think the headline would be Tina Brown's best job offer ever, period. You won't believe what happened next. So refresh our memory about what you heard when you went up to Frank's office that day. Well, he wanted me to be the editor of Harper's Bazaar. He wanted me to leave Vanity Fair and come and be the editor of Harper's Bazaar. And he sort of promised me all the treasures, as it were, of Hearst magazines, the mighty magazine empire. And I was very tempted, actually, because I loved the idea of reinventing another magazine. You know, I'd been at Vanity Fair since 84 at that point. And I've always loved the whole process of reinvention as opposed to being a steward. Vanity Fair was doing really well at that point. We cruised to the top of the heap. And the thought of perhaps having a chance to take another great legendary magazine, Harper's Bazaar, which had the wonderful Carmel Snow as the editor in the 30s and 40s, who was a great heroine of mine. I thought, you know, it might be very exciting. So I was genuinely piqued. My interest was genuinely piqued, which I think is important when you have an offer, if you're going to end up sort of talking to your current boss about it. You don't do that unless you're willing, really interested in leaving. Otherwise, you are frankly just playing with your boss, essentially, and sort of saying, give me a raise. But I was actually very tempted to do it. But in addition to that, He was basically offering you the top job of any magazine they had in their stable, but he was also saying any magazine you'd like to start. And you left the meeting and said something, I guess, to yourself that I found absolutely fascinating. You said to yourself, it felt ridiculous that I couldn't think of anything to want. That's not a position that lots of journalists ever have experienced. And, and certainly now it wouldn't be the case in terms of, you know, the lack of opportunities. But uh, listen, I was editing the best magazine I felt in the world. And frankly, Harper's Bazaar is the only title in his stable I would have considered. So I didn't really want to edit any of the other magazines, and nor did I wish to start one. And so, yeah, I guess it was, uh, I was in a lucky moment in my career, shall we say. I mean, it was the golden moment, right? It was a, the equivalent of peak TV, but peak magazines. There were opportunities. There was companies that were starting things, launching things, doing things with a decent sort of budget and a proper staff. And we did not know how lucky we were at the time. The thing right. about your golden era is you never know you're in one till it stops. So yeah. now I look back and think, my God, that was Camelot. I want to ask you a question that certainly is relevant to Vanity Fair, but You've had so many launches and turnarounds under your belt now. I'm stepping back and asking it in a broader context. And that is when you think about assembling your team, what's your team? What are the essential players you really feel you want with you at the beginning of a launch or the beginning of a turnaround? Well, I actually feel strongly that personality and temperament and sort of psychological meshing is as important as the talent pool. So I'm quite good at that, actually. I have to say, casting a team, it's like casting a show. You want your manager, you want your, what I call, outside person who's connected to the world of artist talent stories in the outside world, but then you want your inside people who are going to like working diligently on people's copy and actually handling the way things run and really a craft element, as it were, of the magazine. You want people with visual sense, you want people with story sense, So it's really about finding those individuals who together make the perfect team. And actually, if you could get that right, it stays together a very long time. And that has certainly been true of everything that I've done. I mean, the team I put together at Vanity Fair literally only left five years ago. They stayed 25 years after I left. And the same is true at The New Yorker, where the team is still there, most of them. Now new people have come in and my people have started to drop from it. But they're all there, most of them. I mean, Jeffrey Tubin left, but David Remnick, of course, who's the editor, Malcolm Gladwell, who I discovered, all of these people, Adam Kopnick, you know, these wonderful writers and editors and so on, they're all mostly still in place. And, you know, you have to refresh the team as well and know when you have to do that, when you have to feel the team is now needing a new injection of blood. And that can sometimes be difficult because then, of course, your fresh new faces that you've put together have suddenly become the old guard. So that's always a little difficult. But I usually didn't stay long enough to have that problem. I used to just (laughs) want to do something else. It's interesting listening to you talk because I'm married to Sarah Noble, who is a recruiter of high-level editorial talent in business finance and entrepreneurship. And she's just closing her business now. She's been at it 25 years. Wow. And if you ask her, when these real high-level searches fail, why do they fail? It's chemistry. Absolutely. She paid so much attention to not just their technical skills or checking their bio. She talks to people who have worked with them to get a sense of what is it like on a day-to-day basis, shoulder to shoulder. 
Well, a lot of people don't do enough diving on that. They tend to kind of go by resumes. And I never did. I never went with people's CVs. It was important to me to know they'd had some experience. But, you know, when I put my first team together at Tatler, my features editor was a former travel agent. But she loved traveling and had lots of ideas and was connected to the world. And I thought this is a person who will bring in a lot of ideas because you have to be engaged with what's happening. And I always like to have somebody with me. Each time I would hire either a TV producer or someone who was not actually a magazine editor who would actually also be part of the team because they had the outreach skills and they also had the producing skills, if you like, to work with the writers. Some writers have great ideas, but they're quite interior and they're not necessarily the best person to bang on the door and get the interview. Some reporters are very good at that, sort of importunate story getting, but others really do much better if you can put the story in front of them and they write some wonderful story, but they're not going to be necessarily the people to get the story. I think that this issue you're raising about chemistry and the importance of the team is related to something that actually goes all the way back to your childhood. And at one point, you're talking about having been kicked out of, I don't know, three prep schools or something like that. And I think you refer to your pranks as, quote, crimes of attitude. And then you go on, of course, several times particularly with regard to Tatler, talking about, look, you might not have money, but you have to have an attitude. And in fact, you really need an attitude when you don't have money. And I think that question of attitude is so linked to the chemistry of the team. Well, that's right. You can't really manufacture that. And it's the same thing, by the way, I used to say, if you haven't got a budget, get a point of view. But also, that's really how I judge writing too. It's not only about what they're writing. It's do they have a voice? Does this person speak to you from the page with a very individual voice? And actually, I was pretty good at finding that, you know, like resonating with that. And I would usually know by about four or five paragraphs in, does this writer have a voice or are they simply a fact gatherer? And the fact is that you can teach a writer how to write a lead. If you like, you can restructure a piece. You can help the writer to shape the piece, but you can't tell a writer how to notice the right things, how to have a voice. I particularly realized this thing about noticing the right things. Well, I was very pleased because I got an interview with somebody on one of my royal books who'd actually been with the queen on the day that Diana died. I thought, bingo, I'm going to get the best eyewitness account. This guy didn't notice anything. I mean, he wasn't being re- you know, retentive about his information. He was just a very dull guy who didn't really notice the right things. He wasn't ac- acute to what atmosphere or what people looked like that day or sounded like or felt like. And actually, one of the things I found during my writing for magazines like Tatler and Vanity Fair, very often photographers were very good sources because actually they noticed things. They went into a room and they actually, they were trying to get a picture and they weren't at all involved in the whole engagement of the information, but they were sensing the best place, the what people wore, you know, the colors, the thing, the where the wind did, what was the view outside the window. They were actually pretty well versed. And I used to get quite a lot of very interesting information from photographers because the other thing is that people don't think they're listening. And of course, you know, they do. And of course, the other thing about a photographer is a subject doesn't pay any attention to the music. Exactly. <laughs> they can be invisible. <laughs> yeah, it's a great tip for young editors these days. Yeah. So I want to fast forward now to your new job, 1984 at Vanity Fair and kind of set the stage for that job. Remind everybody, how old were you again? Just turned 30, actually. I was 30 in November and I took over in January. And I arrived, I had been a consultant at Vanity Fair after Tatler because Tatler was bought by Condé Nast magazines. And meanwhile, in America, while I was working on Tatler in the UK, they'd they'd started Vanity Fair in in America with a massive budget. I mean, my budget at Tatler was absolutely cheese pairing little budget of 10,000 pounds an issue or something ridiculous. And Vanity Fair in America was launching with this massive sort of fad affair. They had a huge advertising campaign, billboards and hoardings in airports saying, coming soon, Vanity Fair. Oh, I remember that. uh, Yeah. And unfortunately, that's always a very bad idea, as a matter of fact, because hype can set you up immediately for a fall. It's very hard to live up to the hype. And the first issues of Vanity Fair were absolute turkeys. I mean, they hired the deputy editor of the New York Times Book Review to be the editor. He'd never done a magazine of this kind he wasn't visual. He had no sense of covers and stories. He really was a sort of literary sub, actually. Right. Really. And it was a massively wrong appointment. They just got it wrong. And unfortunately, the poor guy, he just literally flummoxed and fell on his face. So then they were casting around in this very embarrassing situation. And they put in as a replacement, the features editor of Vogue, who was a 75-year-old, old school kind of vogue friend of, you know, Maria Callas generation. I mean, it was just, again... A terrible appointment. They thought, oh, well, Leo knows the ropes. He'll be able to do something good with the visual staff, et cetera. 
But it was another disastrous appointment. And it was when they started to realize that Leo couldn't do it either. They asked if I would come in and sort of be the kind of young consultant for a while. And I came in the summer of 83 before I took the job to spend six weeks at Vanity Fair and see if I could bring something to it. And I realized within about a few days, really, that he just couldn't do it, you know, and that actually I could. (laughs) I knew what needed to be done. But here I was, I'd been brought in as a consultant, Leo had just got the appointment. So they asked me to stay and say, would I stay with him? And actually, when I look back, this was for me, that was really the audacious part, I think. I thought to myself, well, if I stay and help Leo out, I'm going to wind up just helping Leo out. And I'm going to end up being the magazine editor, really with Leo in charge. And I don't really want that. So I said, thank you very much. I'm going back to the UK. And it was a gamble, actually, because I could have just lost it. And once I got back to the UK, I sat there for a while thinking, I've blown it. I've really blown it. I'm not going to get this job. And it won't come round to me again. Leo's going to be okay. They'll find someone else to help him. And there'll be five years before I hear a peep. But actually, it soon went down, down. And the next thing is, Harry, my husband, and I were on vacation in uh, Barbados, actually, over Christmas. And I got this call saying, would I come into New York and meet with uh, Mr. Newhouse, the chairman of Condé Nast, and Alexander Lieberman, the great editorial director, who was this very cultured sort of artist and style czar, if you like, who was the editorial head of Condé Nast. And I was asked if I would come in. And of course, I realized when they asked me to come in, they were asking me to come in on New Year's Day. So I flew into the meeting and that was it. I never went home again for three years, actually. Harry went back to London. He packed up the house and he did all that and said, you know what, I'll figure it out. I'll figure out a landing pad, which he did. He went off and taught at Duke University for a semester until he joined me in New York as president of Random House. But it was a real gamble, I have to say. And and I, I do say when people ask me about career advice, I, I do tend to say yes. You know, don't ask yourself, is this going to work? Where am I going to live? What am I doing? You know, recognize an opportunity and then figure it out afterwards. I saw it as a great opportunity. And I also think something that's not working is a great opportunity for a sort of young, hungry talent. You know, when I took over Tatler, it was a kind of ridiculous little shiny sheet, you know, with a staple through it, kind of an old debutante joke thing. And yet I I, I could see that was an opportunity. I could take this thing and turn it into a real magazine because the great part about it was it would be mine. So it's much better to have something small, failing, ailing that's yours and you can make an impact and you can sort of put it together and reinvent it than it is to join some big thing as a cog in the machine in some mighty title somewhere where you're just going to be frankly, doing the photocopying and printing things out and getting people's coffee and all that. I would never have worked in in a situation like that. I wanted to get my hands on it and create something of my own, which I did. We'll be right back. Print is Dead is made possible with the support of Mag Culture. Read our online journal, listen to our podcast, and visit our shop to discover why we're convinced print is very much alive. All available at magculture.com. Listening to you talk reminds me, in 75, I was a young editor at New York Magazine, and I got an offer out of the blue from Boston Magazine, which was in really bad shape, to come up and turn it around. And the owner of Boston was infatuated with New York Magazine. I don't think he knew anything about me, he didn't know how old I was. So I went into Clay Felker oh, and, and told him about the offer. And he looked at me quizzically and he said, so what's the question? <laughs> and I said, well, what do you think? And he said, well, I'm going to ask you a question. How many 25-year-olds do you know who get to actually run a magazine? That was so, it. So Clay knew. Clay understood. I mean, exactly right. I was 25 when I took over Tyler. Yeah. And it was tiny, but it was mine. And Vanity Fair is the same. How many times do people get a chance to have something of their own? I'm I mean, glad to hear you did it. And it's so easy to jump to the conclusion that the number one person is responsible, right? But think about what you just said about Lerman. If you had gone in and made him look good, people would have ascribed all of that success to him. Indeed. And not to <laughs> young 30-year-old brother. Exactly. I wasn't having any of that. But yeah. it's a gamble because, as you say, he could have been a giant success with somebody else to help him. So, yes. Well, Clay Falker was a very good friend of mine. And he was a great magazine maker. Oh, my God. I regret that I never was able to work for him. The timing was never such that I would be able to work for Clay, but I would have loved to do so because I think he was one of the great magazine visionaries of all time. Can you, in a sentence or two, put your finger on what you thought it was that was the driver of Clay's brilliance? He had this fantastic sense of story and this wild curiosity. You'd have dinner with Clay and you'd start talking and he would immediately start driving down to like what was interesting. What, you know, he, he was just this omnivorous devourer of the world and was able to then turn what he'd heard into a story idea. And he really 
believed, as I do, that people on magazines have to be engaged with the world they're covering. And he used to walk through those offices, apparently at New York Magazine, and he would say to people at the lunch hour, why are you here? Because he thought people should be out, like attending a panel or, or going to a talk or seeing a movie or, you know, something to bring back like a golden retriever to the pages of, of the magazine. And I believe that's what an editor does. Now, there are different kinds of editor. There are the impresario editors like Clay and, and frankly, like I am. Or there are sometimes there's editors who stay behind a shut door and they edit copy. But personally, I think a magazine editor has to be an impresario because you're putting together all of these elements. And so it's not just about words on a page. It's also the visuals, the cover, the packaging, the, the mix. All yes. of those things take a much more entrepreneurial attitude to the form of magazines. I'll tell you a funny story about Clay in this context, which is in 1975, just before I left, and we had acquired the Village Voice. John Simon, the theater critic, was on vacation. So I got Gary Giddens to review a play. And we ended up writing a scathing review of a play called Dr. Jazz, which was in preview, but was supposed to open up the following night. And the play didn't open. And I had already committed to publishing it. So a scathing review comes out of a play that hasn't formally opened yet. And I walk in on Tuesday morning and the whole newsroom gets really quiet. And they're all looking at me. And Clay just is standing in the corner. And so Gary and I are there. And we're two kids. And so we walk in. And it was a who's who of Broadway. And they were there to protest. And Clay had said to Gary and me, don't say a word. And we walk in and he goes, I told you. Look at how young they are. They're babies. Okay, you can leave now. So they left. We left. I went back to the newsroom. Gary went back to The Voice. The Theater Alliance crew left. And that afternoon, Clay came over. And he leaned over my desk. And he said, do you think you're going to be fired? And I said, well, I called my wife to warn her. He said, I have one message for you. Aren't magazines amazing? Oh, I love it. Yeah, <laughs> he really had a great time. It, it was the most fun. You know, one of his greatest friends and writers is this wonderful man, Edward J. Epstein, who just died. He was really, extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, it was a great era. I don't think people really appreciated Epstein. No, I did. I thought he was an amazing journalist. Incredible. He also shared Clay's great sort of avid devouring of the world, the scene. He was a great friend of the British tycoon, Jimmy Goldsmith. He used to yes. fly around in his jet and Ed would go with him and touch down in Paris and Mexico and always the observer, always like never caught up in it, but always the one who could see and learn. And I mean, he was just, he just loved it. And he would then regale the world with what he saw. Now I'm going to fast forward to you moving to the New Yorker, which I know took a lot of people by surprise. And yet, in your book, The Vanity Fair Diaries, going all the way back to 1987, you write, the New Yorker needs a fresh layout, cover lines, more vibrant cover illustrations, blurbs introducing the stories, the introduction of photography, shorter pieces to vary the length and tone, and a contents page. And that paragraph ends with a very emphatic and enigmatic, hmm. So <laughs> was that you already anticipating a move? Well, I think it was me realizing that I knew exactly what it needed. And once I identified that I, I, I have that vision, then the next stage is like, well, how can I implement it? You know, I didn't actually want to move to it when I first was offered it, as you see in the diaries. It took me a year or two to want to because I had young kids. And I also, I loved Vanity Fair. And, you know, Cy Newhouse put in Bob Gottlieb in between. But I gradually came to see that actually I did understand exactly what the New Yorker needed. And it was a great and wonderful literary challenge, as well as being just an editing challenge to think that I could save this crown jewel of the empire, as it were. Because it really was, the New Yorker was dying when I took it over. It was, as Tom Wolfe once brilliantly put it, easier to praise than to read. I mean, people would say, oh, yes, I have the New Yorker. Of course, I read the New Yorker, but they weren't reading the New Yorker. And it was gradually losing all of its advertisers. And it was a very aging demographic. It was a dying brand, is the truth. And it had about 600,000 readers. But as you know, with the 600,000 readers who are gradually getting old and peeling off, and they weren't the people the advertisers wanted to reach. So if I hadn't come in then at that moment, it really was on its last legs is the truth. It was quite close to folding. It was a very exciting moment to be able to come in and, and save it. You know, I love that mission, yeah. which is very high adrenaline. In a recent conversation with David Remnick, he pointed out he thinks that people, even really savvy media people, dramatically underestimated the nature of the turnaround and pointed yeah. out that the New Yorker had really been in trouble gradually since the late 60s. Yes. It's, this was not recent. Well, it takes a long time for a great title like that to die. And it was like 10 years in the dying, as it were, maybe more. But it was very exciting to turn it around. My goal was to keep the best of it and bring in new exciting blood. And I think that's really important in a turnaround. I mean, I often see 
new people coming into organizations, they make big dramatic statements about, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And they diss essentially the thing that they've taken over and said, we're going to make this so different. And I really didn't do that, actually. I thought it was very important to respect the legacy of what was there. I mean, let's face it, there was John Updike, there was Roger Angel, there was Lydia yeah, oh, Ross. Yeah. There were some amazing people there. So my goal was to keep those people, and I did, and sort of thin out. That there was a kind of underbelly of quite mediocre people, quite honestly. I used to define them as people who thought that they were good because they were there as opposed to being there because they were good, which is different. It's like, oh, yes, I write for The New Yorker, but actually they're pretty mediocre. And there was a lot of them, a lot. And they'd started to gather in greater and greater numbers. So what I had to do, frankly, was to take out that layer, keep the great people like Updike and Angel and the late great Brendan Gill, and bring in people who I thought in their own way were good or even better, such as Anthony Lane and Remnick and Jane Mayer and Ken Auletta. These are all the new people that came in. And they were every bit as good and sometimes better than some of the people who'd been there before. So that was really the challenge. And then visually, it hadn't been visually interesting since the days of Harold Ross in the 20s and 30s. I what I discovered when I went back to look at the very first issues was how different the early New Yorker was to the sort of late period New Yorker. It was much more visually vibrant. They had people like Peter Arno and Charles Adams, and they would use those brilliant cartoonists full page. Those cartoons were full page. And the covers, they had an iconoclasm to them. So that's what I really decided I had to do, was to find a whole new race of cartoonists out there and illustrators and bring back that whole sense of visual irreverence to the magazine. And I replaced the quite, frankly, stale cartoon editor with a new cartoon editor, Bob Mankoff, who only just recently retired, a wonderfully hysterically funny character, and I brought in Francois Mouly, who's still there, actually, to be yeah. the illustrations and covers editor. So I replaced the whole visual team, essentially. It's very interesting, having read the diaries, to compare the early days, your early days at Vanity Fair, huddled in a room with Churchyard and Ruth Ansell, and literally reinventing the magazine. And I'm talking about in an unbelievably granular level of detail, where you're not just reinventing what a contents page is for the first time, but you're also talking about small photos in the margins, a really elegant black room here. <laughs> but I mean, from the ground up. Well, I think it's all terribly important. I mean, I think captions, for instance, are incredibly important. Headlines, captions, blurbs, they're the things that give a magazine voice. I always felt that you had to be able to throw a magazine on the floor and have it fall open and know what that magazine's title was. Right. And you knew that from the layout, from the headlines, style, from the pullout quotes. All those things I really drilled down on every pullout quote in that magazine was chosen by me because I felt that I was giving the flavor that I wanted to give of that particular article, and I knew how to pull in the reader from those things. And they're small accumulating details that make up uh, a very compelling page. But it's gone. It's an art form that's over. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we can reminisce for a minute here, right? <laughs> yes. It was an art form. There's no doubt about it. It was. Yeah, it was. It was. I love the story about you rummaging around as you get ready for the April issue of Vanity Fair, the first issue of yours and finding an Annie Leibovitz portfolio of up-and-coming comedians in the art oh, department. Gosh. And I fell in love with it. I said, hey, April Fool's, I wrote the headline. And then there was like Pee Wee Herman and Whoopi Goldberg in the bath, if you remember that wonderful picture of Whoopi Goldberg in that white milk bath. I mean, these were iconic pictures when you look at them, and there they were yes. looking in a drawer. I, I suppose you didn't find any of those when you were rummaging around the New Yorker? No, I didn't. But I was able to go out and find a whole lot of new illustrators like Edward Sorrell, who was a great illustrator, Art Spiegelman, Barry Blitt, Bruce McCall. These were all wonderful people that I brought into The New Yorker and they really enlivened the look and brought color to the pages too. And then I actually brought into The New Yorker the very first photographer as a staff photographer. That was Richard Avedon. I thought, yeah. I want to open the windows of the magazine. I want to bring in photography, but I want it to be in keeping with the pristine Caslon typeface of The New Yorker and make it feel really matched to the, to the words and to the seriousness. And I felt the only photographer I knew that really could do that in, in a way that would be absolutely perfect would be Avedon. And he was for several years. He was the only photographer that ever worked with us. And, you know, the idea was to put in two or three maximum Avedon shots in that great, clean, strong, black and white style of his. And they just made the pages sing. It was very interesting listening to David Remnick talk about 
how without the work that you had done, he never, ever would have been able to do what he's done with The New Yorker. Oh, that's generous of him. David is a massive talent, so yeah, he would he have got there. there. I, I would say that certainly I did have to break the China to make it what it became, and he's done a wonderful job ever since. What's the one thing, when you look back on your time at The New Yorker, you would do over? The Easter oh, Bunny yeah. on a Cross cover? Yeah, I wasn't thrilled with that when I look back. Mostly because it actually appeared the week that I was getting the National Magazine Awards, you know, for <laughs> general excellence. And so there was all this uproar going on about this cover just at the moment when I actually should have been sitting there basking and having a very good week. So, yeah, I probably wouldn't do that again. But I wanted to sort of stand behind Art Spiegelman, you know, because Art Spiegelman is such an amazing talent. He's very iconoclastic and he's very dangerous, essentially, in what he wants to do. And I was always standing behind him and I felt... If this is what he really wanted to do, I would take a deep breath and, and have him do it. But probably I wouldn't do that again. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. Print is Dead is made possible by the support of the Society of Publication Designers. The SPD powers the future of visual storytelling, setting the standard for editorial excellence, and shaping the future of visual culture. For more information, visit spd.org. One of the things that I find really interesting in your writing are the comparisons that you make between England and the U.S. And I want to start in particular with the comparison that you make about British journalists and American journalists, which might help explain the, the massive exodus of journalists out of the U.K. here into the U.S., where it seems as if everybody I'm familiar with anyways had extraordinary success. What is it about you Brits and the, and the sensibility, seriously, that you bring here, that publishing sensibility, that works so well. Well, I think that the plurality of the British press means that there's a lot more experimentation and less sort of stuffed shirtery going on amongst what I call the quality press. The English press is far more eclectic in its attitude and in its high-low aesthetic, essentially. You know, a famous name like, I don't know, John le Carré or someone would not be at all dismayed by writing for a tabloid. It, it, you know, if the money was good, it remains in England a sort of informal profession where people do not feel that they're part of the sort of highbrow press and therefore they wouldn't be called dead in a tabloid or something. That's not true in the UK press. There's a lot more crossover between high-low tabloids and broadsheets, little magazines as we call them, which is like the New Statesman kind of magazine or the New Republic kind of magazine here as it would have been, those things are far more informal and light in terms of aesthetic and the fact that different people can work for them and there's much less of a pompous attitude, quite honestly, to journalism. So I think at its worst, British journalism can be really salacious, etc. But there's also a lot of talent and enjoyment of words and irreverence that goes into putting out some of the most kind of tabloid newspapers. I mean, the headlines picture cropping, picture editing, picture choice, for instance, in the British tabloids is superbly good most of the time. And just, you know, nothing like it in the United States, actually. I can't think of a newspaper. I mean, newspapers are dead anyway, frankly. But I mean, before they died, I used to be amazed at how dull many of them look, quite frankly, compared to the British press. And indeed, the European press. You know, I, I love the French and German magazines of the past, like probably they're in bad shape now, but things like Stern magazine in Germany or Paris March in, in France. These were very sort of more racy in their outlook. And I think that's probably why British editors kind of cross over here and they make an impact on us because they're splashier, essentially, yeah. and yeah. much more irreverent. And I think it plays well for modern tastes. You know, when you're talking about journalism as an industry in the UK, using the example of John le Carre being willing to write for a tabloid, that also reminds me of British actors. Same exact thing. You know, I'm amazed to find some That's of the right. amazing talent and they're doing TV series for the BBC and mystery shows. It's they're true. extraordinary. They're, they're, they are. They see it as a job. They don't see it as a sacred calling. And I think there's something to be said for that, you know, because it's a little bit more scrappy, I think, than it is here. And I think that's served us well, actually. And yeah, there's a second diaspora going on now. You know, we've now got, you know, British has just taken over CNN, Mark Thompson, who came from... The BBC and took over the New York Times. There is Will Lewis, who came out of the, the Telegraph and, and some of Murdoch's stuff right. the uh, Wall Street Journal. He's now taken over at the Washington Post. So a second influx is coming our way. <laughs> and Emma Tucker has taken over from the London Sunday Times, has taken over the Wall Street Journal. So yes, another horde has arrived since my day. Well, made for good spectator sport, right? So I want to ask you about 
the the moments in your diaries when you talk about the house that you and Harry had in Quag on Long Island and your whole t- the tone, the pace, the rhythm of your prose slows down. Can you talk about that a little bit? Do you still have that house? Well, I still have a house in Quag, but not that one, which got thoroughly damaged by Hurricane Sandy. You know, it's my place. It's my happy place. It really always was. I like to live life at a frantic pace in the week, and then I completely contract out at the weekend. And I do slow down, and Quag always represented that spiritual home where I could get out there, light the fire in winter, or, or, or walk on the beach, and just completely turn into a different rhythm, which would be more contemplative, more meditative. It's where I did my writing. It's where Harry did his writing and where I could be with my children. And it was just, you know, an, another way of life. And without it, I would honestly have totally incinerated because I could not live at that pace and work at that pace without being able to then go into this other zone. And I've always lived like that. And I still do, actually, even though Harry's no longer with me, I still always go out to Quag as whenever I can. I mean, really every weekend, unless I can't for any reason. And I do the same thing. I'm on my own now. But, you know, I read, I walk, I think. I relax, and I'm very then rejuvenated for Monday morning. Okay, two questions to wrap up now. One is, you have to ask this. Anyone who reads the Vanity Fair diaries has a vivid sense of the Tina Brown of the 80s, and I'm assuming the 90s and on. What's the Tina Brown of today like? I'm still living as a frantic pace. I'm Two things I'm actually doing at the moment. I wrote my book, obviously, on the Royals last year, which did very well, and that was my total obsession for a year and a half. I'm now guest curator of the Aspen Ideas Festival, which means it's 25 panels a day for seven days. So it's a bit like putting out a massive magazine with, you know, endless features in it, which is sort of enormous fun. And I also started an investigative journalism summit in London in my husband's name and legacy called Truth Tellers, the Harry Evans Investigative Journalism Summit. I launched it last May. I raised the money. I convened about 60 incredible journalists from all over the world. So I'm still just as engaged with journalism, but I'm using live platforms to essentially be my magazine replacements. I I find that the convening of sort of panels, discussions, interviews, so on, I mean, it's not as much of a gratification as the page, but it's as near as I can get to the sort of mix and excitement and intellectual sort of combinations of people and so on that were very similar to magazine. In fact, doing the Aspen Ideas Festival is really like doing the New Yorker, but on steroids for seven days. And I'm enjoying that at the moment. So I haven't slowed down and I haven't really stopped bringing my own creativity to a mix of ideas. I am omnivorous when it comes to ideas and engagement, politics, foreign affairs, you know, culture. I'm a a news junkie. I'm an entertainment junkie. I'm, you know, I'm just as engaged essentially as I always was really by putting out magazines. Well, we're thrilled to hear that. Now, to close, we have to ask you what I'm, I'm, I don't know whether we tipped you off to this or not, but we end most of our podcasts or many of them with what we call the billion dollar question. And in your case, the question is this, imagine that it's 2005-ish and Laurie and Powell Jobs wants to give you and Harry a billion dollars with one caveat. You have to launch something in print. She loves what you have done in print. What would the two of you have made? I think we'd have done a newspaper magazine together. We always wanted to do that. It's something that had the feel of a newspaper. It was actually a magazine. And I still think that could be enormously exciting. However, I don't think anybody reads print now. And until we have a module on our computer where you could just hit print and yeah. up comes a completely bound, which may happen. I mean, it's not at all a non-possibility in today's tech world, particularly it can happen. And maybe that will be the answer to revive some print, because I have to say that what is boring about reading everything online, and it is boring, it's just an uncalibrated list of stories. There's yeah. no sense of hierarchy of any kind. You can't splash a headline, you can't splash a picture and say, this is the important thing today, or you can't create an energy of pay attention to this. It's just a boring list of stories, and down you scroll. And yes, you could, you know, blow up the picture if you want and look at the pictures and so on. It doesn't have anything like the glory of a double page spread by Annie Leibovitz. It just doesn't. Right. It never has and it never will. But like everybody else, I read everything on my phone. So I can't pretend that I'm sitting here reading a pile of print magazines because I'm not. I'm reading everything on my phone. But you do sound excited about the potential for this. By the way, did it have a name or do you not want to go public with that just in case? We never gave it a name, but we used to talk about it sometimes at breakfast. You know, I think if you could print it maybe instantaneously, maybe people would. Who knows? But I 
suspect it's gone and it's all about the digital. But the only thing I will say is that, you know, people tire of things. And sometimes people, they call it retro perhaps, but our kids who never saw magazines and grew up reading everything on the phones, they might find print exciting and exotic to try to create it this way. But right now it just feels like it's gone. For more on Tina Brown, subscribe to her podcast, TBD with Tina Brown, where she talks with actors, politicians, journalists, and the newsmakers of tomorrow. Her 2022 book, The Palace Papers, Inside the House of Windsor, The Truth and the Turmoil, and our favorite, 2018's The Vanity Fair Diaries, are available wherever books are sold. If you'd like to connect more deeply with our guests, be sure to visit our website where we have complete transcripts of all our interviews, along with portfolios, archival photos, links, and other great information. Visit longliveprint.co slash interviews for more. Print is Dead, Long Live Print is a member of the Hub and Spoke Audio Collective, a nonprofit association of audio storytellers dedicated to promoting and sustaining high-quality independent podcasting, including the Peabody Award-winning Rumble Strip, the number one podcast according to both The Atlantic and The New Yorker, who described it as a limitless podcast about life in Vermont. In each episode, host Erica Heilman invites herself into people's homes to find out what they know, hate, love, what they're afraid of, and what makes them more like you than you'd realize. These are the messy, obsessively crafted stories of the everyday. For more, visit rumblestripvermont.com or find it wherever you get your podcasts. Print is Dead, Long Live Print is made possible by support of listeners like you. If you'd like to contribute to keeping the podcast going, there are two easy ways. One, become a sustaining patron by making a monthly donation. Or two, make a one-time donation in the amount that works best for you. Visit printisdead.co slash support for more information. Print is Dead, Long Live Print is a production of Modus Operandi Design. For more information, visit our website, printisdead.co. Or if you're an optimist, longliveprint.co. Follow us on social media at printisdeadpod. Please give us a like and a review on your favorite podcast app. It really helps. Thanks very much for listening.